Strap on your safety meat, because here it is, the movie that started this whole show. This time we take on that film that everyone, some people, that happened a few years ago. James Cameron's Avatar. Next, on the movie wrench. Welcome to the Movie Wrench, the show where we take big pokes at big movies. This time out, it's the movie that got my angry little nerd heart all hot and bothered in the first place, the film that caused me to actually go out and start a blog, as if that's still a thing. Yes, James Cameron's mega diplodocus of a film, Avatar. So, douchebag, what is it about this film that's got you so gosh darn angry? <laughs> well, little rabbit, I'll tell you. As always, I'll try to keep to my three major points. And also, we will have fun-ruining, nasty-bad, giga-throbbing spoilers. So beware. I'm going to assume that you know the story. If you don't, go off and see Dances with Wolves and Little Big Man and then come back. Go ahead, I'll wait. Before I start slinging hash, let me just say that I don't hate the entirety of this film. There are really good parts in it, unfortunately they tend to be buried under the dubious benefit of 3D. See, Cameron swears up and down that 3D really helps immerse an audience, and that this film would be like no other. Well, he was partially correct. It did change things. It made it more expensive to go to the movies. Yay. Thank you, Spotmaker. A good, well-constructed story will immerse people better than some stupid gimmick, but I digress already. See? Told you so. Most of the movie is pretty good. I like the Na'vi. I like most of the characters. And those unsung heroes of the special effects units? Without them, this movie wouldn't have been made at all. It's very pretty. And the story unfolds reasonably enough, although in fairly predictable ways, and we like it. And then... And then... But let's start small. Really tiny, itty bitty small. About that big, just about that big. Tiny. So there's this stuff, this thing, this obvious MacGuffin that's supposed to drive the whole plot and send humans gazillions of light years out in the space to another planet to get this dingus. The first problem I have with this, whatever it is, is the name. Cameron gives it a name that knocks us right out of the story, makes us roll our eyes and sigh with the flavor of our favorite craft brew still heavy on our breath. Unobtainium. Yes, unobtainium. Sure, it gets a giggle at the multiplex, but is that what we really want? It's so silly, it makes everything feel pointless and stupid and breaks the tension right from the get-go. But that's just the beginning. See, they never tell, show, or otherwise explain why this stuff is so important, why we want it. We look at it, it looks like pyrite. It has one single property which gives us any kind of clue as to why someone would put forth this flubity blab just to get it. It floats. This in and of itself isn't a problem. The problem comes when they tell us that the main deposit of this floating metal is beneath the giant tree that the alien people live in. Then later, there are these giant floating mountains, and no one is interested in them! And what's going on there? Dragons roost there! Nobody lives there. There's no sacred ground there. It's just floating rocks and vines and waterfalls. But nobody wants that. Oh no, that's not where the plot is buried. It's beneath the big old Simba uh, tree. No sense, no monkey, no banana. If we have to have this big plot contrivance, for the love of Orson Welles, please change its name. Make it actually connected to the big tree thing and not obviously connected to the giant floating empty album the. Uh, Mountains. Mountains. Simple. There's a lot of tech in this movie. Kind of a lot of it. And it's kind of really kind of important. Kind of. What's so absolutely wrong is the levels of tech in this film. They make absolutely no sense. They don't bear scrutiny. They won't wash while I dry. We're told that Jake, because you can't get any more action here we kind of named than Jake, 
has this spinal injury that only gobs and gobs of cash can cure. And gosh, medical science can only do so much. And yet, in the last few years, they've been able to create these empty alien beings spliced from local and human DNA, and they can wirelessly transmit your entire mind and psyche into them without obvious means. And these avatars, if you will, and I won't, eat and poop like the real thing. So wait, are they real things? Because how can people transmit their being into these giant smurfs if they don't have any kind of electronics? So are they robots? Because if they are, behold the god who bleeds. Bing. Everyone on this planet accepts these things as real. How does that work? Is there a network of cell towers? Can Jake survive on 3G? Remember, we have all of this and interstellar travel, and yet we still can't fix a spinal injury. And we still have wheelchairs because that's the best way of getting around. Except for those giant robots the army guys are sauntering about and whoa, whoa, down maybe down. See, this problem can leach into all sorts of other areas. Triffids pop up everywhere before you can round up the little bastard. So I'll just cut myself off here because... Now remember your blood pressure, Gertrude. This is kind of big. Oh. And Jake is at the center of this issue. I think it makes the most sense to rewrite this character and give him different motivation because as it stands, <laughs> he's kind of like the turd in the tidy bowl. His spinal injury and the supposed inability to easily repair it is, quite bluntly, stupid. And I don't buy him being the dumb twin. Is that even a thing? Bing. And why does he have to be here by mistake? Why can't he just be assigned here by the military side of things? That would give us the same tension between Dr. Goodall and Bing. Major Stress. Bing. Then again, this part of the story doesn't make any sense anyway. The military has been waiting around for years for the scientists to convince the Na'vi to give them the bright shiny stuff and suddenly the military's out of patience? I don't believe for an instant that Sergeant Slaughter would just wait around quietly all this time. Evil bad company would have come in and done a snatch and grab long ago. And hey, how about Paul Reiser reprising his role from Aliens, am I right? No, wait, wait. I'm doing it again. Because with this big tech problem, I could go on and on about the stupidity of humans even being on the surface in the first place. Stop, stop, stop! <laughs> Okay, this one leads to the reason why I wanted to stomp out of the theater, why my nerd rage shot through my eyes and drenched my popcorn. This point made me raise my puny fist into the air and shout from the depths of my very being, me. We're told very early on that this planet is special and that everything seems to be connected. The tree's roots link together in a kind of neural net that's many times denser than our own brain. The Na'vi have these little USB plugs that allow them to slide into animals' consciousnesses. There's so much evidence that this world is one big giant organism, and yet when it's being crushed, killed, and destroyed, only the Great White Hunter can come in to gather the troops to fight off the um, Great White Hunters. And what we end up with is blood boiling a half a billion dollar fist fight. This is the biggest lost opportunity of the film, because instead of the world coming together, acting in concert to fend off the intruder, what we get is bows and arrows against tanks and fighter planes. And it doesn't make sense until suddenly it does, because early on we see arrows bouncing harmlessly off planes' canopies, and then later they go through, and things explode, and... and... You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> breathing, breathing. The worst part about this needless battle is that it wouldn't even be enough to hold off this giant evil conglomco for very long anyway. Sure, we have that scene at the end where all the remaining bad guys, including Paul Reiser, are being marched off planet in a big spanky very much scene, but sure, this makes sense because the Na'vi are just going to stand there instead of murdering the people that destroyed their way of life, their, their families, and bulldoze their sacred sites. Yeah, right. This only makes sense if Cameron plans to make lots and lots of these. Oh, this just in. Seems he does. Well, just drat and drat and triple drat. Really, what should have happened is that the planet should have connected together. Sure, sure, through Jake if we really racist have to. It should have risen all in one and smothered the intruders. 
It's about the only thing that would have convinced Huge Kilko that it was never worth coming back. We spend the entire movie studying an interesting alien culture, only so Cameron can commit a western. It really becomes cowboys and Indians just so Captain Catastrophe can fulfill his horribly obvious cliched potential. This film could have been so much more. It could have been a good, fascinating, cultural study, adventure, science fiction film. Instead, we're just clubbed over the head with the same old cheese-filled sweat sock. Yahoo. And that, Kitty Winkies, is my very self-abbreviated rant on Avatar The Last Air Biscuit. Trust me, this could easily have been a two-parter. Count yourselves lucky. Both of you. Come back again if we, and I do mean we, take on another fetid offering from those cultural cretins of Hollywood. Thanks for watching. Bing! Tune in next time. We tighten the nuts in another giant, huge, mega, big, smash explosion of a movie. And remember, these are only opinions. Mine. They don't hurt much. This is for the reshoot because dumbass filmed all of his rehearsals instead of the actual performances.